So I'm, I'm starting just as a background photo, so I've started with this beautiful shot. It's actually there's a little church on the Mount of Olives called Dominus Flevit, which is the Latin for um, the Lord wept. And so it's, it's uh, a church that commemorates the episode in Luke's Gospel. Jesus arrives on what's going to be, it turns out, his final journey to Jerusalem. And he stops on the Mount of Olives partway down and he weeps over this place and which doesn't seem to understand peace. Um, even though, of course, Jerusalem, uh, one of the ways of it making sense of the name Jerusalem is that it's, it's about the city of peace, Shalayim, Shalom. So this, this particular um, window, they've, they've created this, it's, it's a fairly modern church built in, the, I think, early 20th century, and they've very cleverly designed the window behind the altar so that it captures the Dome of the Rock perfectly, depending just quite where you're standing. Uh, you've got the slight angle, so you've got this window, and what you can see there is the cross that's on the altar, and the, just see the top of the altar, and some candles, little candle things over here. So literally it's just the top of the altar, and then you look back through, and on the, in the distance you've got the Harama Sharif, which and the old city walls. When we say they're old, they're only 500 years old. Okay, they're not old, old. They're from the Mamluk period, and um, from Suleiman the Magnificent, and of course uh, the centerpiece of that is the uh, uh, Dome of the Rock. But if you look beyond the Dome of the Rock and know what you're looking for, over here are the great domes of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, and over on this side, not so easy to pick up with this sort of resolution, is the white dome of, of the Ahurva Synagogue. So looking through the window, you see the holy places of Muslims, Jews, and Christians captured in this one um, beautiful scene. Okay, so I want to think a little bit this morning about the, um, the dynamics of the conflict over Palestine and go back and look at the roots of, of the conflict and how, and I'm going to give you some information and then leave some time for questions, one of my one of my friends was joking when I said I was putting together this talk. One of my friends in Nazareth said, "Oh, you'll just press the start button and talk for two hours." So I've tried to plan some, some what might be useful things to put in, so we can then have the questions and discussion. So I'm drawing across on the fact that um, I've been privileged in the last 15 years, particularly, to spend quite a bit of time over there. Uh, to live there for a while, to work there, but also to go and be involved with the um, archaeological dig at Bethsaida. And my contacts go back to about 1990. So I've been going, going to the Holy Land on and off at, for various reasons. So, um, so my, what I'm going to be talking about is partly research, because I got interested in the question, and partly uh, personal knowledge of some of the dynamics involved. So let's start by thinking about the place, and we are doing that just before we got going, I guess. Uh, paying attention briefly to the physical characteristics of the land. Um, it's a tiny place, but it's big in people's imagination. It's big in the significance. Uh, it features in hymns and prayers and liturgies out of all proportion to its actual size. Um, and of course, the, the land of Israel, the land of Palestine, is, is, is very small and it's in a challenging location. It's in a difficult neighborhood. And it's because it's the bridge, effectively, between Africa and Asia. So in the, in, until modern transport meant that you didn't have to march your soldiers from one place to the other. And, and so that's, that's a fairly recent change. These days we fly them in. Um, but until the last even less than 100 years, this, whoever controlled this bit of territory um, controlled access to, to the other end, basically. It is in no sense a land that flows with milk and honey. That's one of the first and the worst of the real estate slogans. Okay? It is not, it's not the pick of the crop in terms of the land in the Middle East. Lebanon is much better than Palestine. Um, and, and Egypt is even better again. Okay, so, so when, you, when the Israelites tell a story about how they escaped from Egypt and they found freedom in this beautiful land that flows with milk and honey, they're partly whistling in the dark because, yes, they were slaves in Egypt, but Egypt was kind of beautiful. 
and, and fertile and abundant and had masses of water. And uh, most of Palestine is fairly marginal, fairly marginal territory. So it's in no sense a land that flows with milk and honey, although you can make a good living there. Um, this is just putting it in its context, I was describing before. The areas that are green, the, 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 on this map the colours, green represents, um, well, all the colours represent elevation. So the greener it is, the lower the elevation above sea level, and the whiter it is, the higher it is above sea level, snow-capped mountains. So you can see the green swathe of land coming around from basically the so-called Fertile Crescent, coming up through what is today is Iran and Iraq, the Tigris and Euphrates, Mesopotamia, sweeping up into the top of Syria, and then down the narrow, narrow coastal edge, and then into Egypt. Uh, and Egypt, of course, is desert, but it has this wonderful river, which, which allows irrigation and so on to be conducted. So even in that land mass, what we're talking about is this tiny bit just here. It's only a tiny bit of that whole strategic area. Yeah. You said it was part of the Rift Valley, so where does it go? The Rift Valley, in ancient, well, the Rift Valley actually starts down here in um, East Africa, and it runs up the Red Sea, then up the Gulf of Aqaba, and it goes right up here to the, and runs into the mountains of Lebanon. This is the mountains of Lebanon here. So the Red Sea is part of that great rift valley. Yep. Um, this is just a diagram, a map that shows how in ancient times the strategic value of this place meant that it was constantly being invaded by Egypt, by um, civilizations in Mesopotamia, by empires based in what today we call Turkey, by uh, people from Greece, Macedonia, namely um, of course Alexander the Great, and eventually by the Romans. And that continues on, and we'll talk, a bit, we'll talk about the French and the British and the Russians and so on very shortly. The countryside itself is very small, as I said, from um, Jerusalem is, let me think, Jerusalem is roughly here, and Nazareth is here, okay? And from there to there, a straight line is 100 kilometres. By the time you get there, which you can't just drive straight through, it's about two hour drive. But it's, it's not, I mean, that's what? That's less than from here to Tweed Heads. And that's all we're talking about. It's a tiny bit of dirt. Okay? Tiny country. Now, of course, with modern weapons, that also means, I mean, it might have taken you three days to march your soldiers from Jerusalem to Tiberias, but how long does it take a missile? And how much time do you have to intercept the missile if your country's only this wide? So you can see where the missile defence systems and some of those things come, come into play. This, this diagram is just to remind us of, of the profile of the land. And again, the, the areas that are brown are part of this ancient mountain system, which was cracked in half by the Great Rift Valley. Um, the area to the left, to the western side, is, is basically fairly fertile, but not once you get down here. This is basically very marginal sort of semi-desert. This is also semi-desert or desert. And, and the, the best parts of the country agriculturally is this lovely plain between the Sea of Galilee and Haifa or Akko, plain of Jezreel. But it was also swampy land until about 100 years ago. Okay, again, the, the swamp has been drained by um, sort of Jewish um, settlers, farmers, and so it's now a very productive area. And the coastal strip, has always been fairly fertile, and it could, but in biblical times, the coastal strip was the land of the Philistines, and the Israelites and the Jews were up here in the hills, which meant these guys down here that had chariots couldn't catch them because you can't ride chariots in the mountains. Mm -hmm. So the technology gave uh, a space for the early Israelite tribes to coalesce. Uh, it's a bit like Greece in that um, there are very distinct regions and, and, um, and each, each of these micro regions has its own kind of potential economically. There are many names for a, a place that's in the middle between empires. Um, and of course names tend to be given to places by conquerors. I mean that's part of the debate about who's crossing. 
<coughs> excuse me, Coots Crossy. Um, that's a name we gave to the area. Whether or not it was an appropriate person to be remembering, that's that's that's, that's the sort of that's a European name for that space. It presumably had once upon a time an indigenous name, which may or may not be remembered. Similar thing happens in Israel today. Israel is systematically changing even the way the Arabic names for places are being spelt and pronounced to make them sound more Jewish. So the town of Afuli, which is the Arabic name for this town, um, even when the roads department puts the signs up as they do in Hebrew, Arabic and English, they write, they spell it in Arabic in the Hebrew way. So, so they, wrote, they write Afula in Arabic, not Afuli, even though Afuli is the Arabic name for it. So they're slowly um, twisting the knobs, as it were, to impose their cultural setting on the local people. So I always say Afuli, and my Jewish friends will say Afula, and they know every time I say Afuli, I'm making a political point. I'm refusing to call it by the Jewish name. Okay. Because names have coded values, what we call something, sends a message, and the, most of the time the message is, we won, you lost, get used to it. Okay, that's, that's sort of what's going on with names. Palestine itself has become a controversial name for this bit of land, and people will say, well, it was never called Palestine back in the biblical periods. It only was called Palestine by the Romans after they had destroyed Jerusalem the second or so time, <laughs> after the second, third Jewish revolt. Um, and they expelled the Jewish people from the country and they renamed it from Judea to, to what they call Palestrina, Palestine. And that's half true. And because half facts that are half true are tricky. Uh, why did the Romans choose that name? Did they just come up with a name that had never been used before? No, they went back to a traditional name. And the Greek historian Herodotus, writing about 500 BC, he describes a large salt, he's talking about the Dead Sea, and he says there's a large lake which is so salty you can't sink in it. Objects float on the top of the water, and it's in the district of Syria called Palestine. Okay, because the other thing is that all of that country is not on the map anymore, but all of that country is technically Syria. Um, or it can be called Canaan, or it can be called Palestine. Yeah, there are different names for it. Um, so Palestine is what the country has been known. The area has been called Palestine since at least 500 BC. And there are some ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs that, that also talk of Palisset, which is probably the same word. And that goes back to about 1200 BC. In any case, certainly from about 100 AD down to the modern, modern time, almost 2000 years, the country, the land has just been called Palestine. And so if you looked at, at uh, maps that you might have had in your back of your Bible as a kid growing up, there would have been maps for Palestine in the time of Jesus. And so on. That was just what we called that country. Since 1948, of course, it's been a problem for Jewish people to call that country Palestine because they want us to call it Israel. Again, names have coded value. So they, part of what's happened is there has been an attempt until recently to eradicate the word Palestine and Palestinian from the Western vocabulary. Okay? That changed with the uh, peace accord or with the first round of the Oslo agreements because then it was no longer illegal to use the word Palestine because Israel had signed an agreement to set up a Palestinian authority. But when I was first in Jerusalem, um, the kids would come out and they would paint Palestinian flags on the stone walls of the houses overnight. And then first thing in the morning, the Israeli soldiers would come around, grab half a dozen kids at gunpoint and make them wash the flag because it was illegal to fly a Palestinian flag in Jerusalem. Now they're everywhere. So that is one of the differences. Um, the, the, the word Palestine has, after being all, sort of the word that could not be said in the 1950s and 1960s, has now started to come back. And people talk about Palestinians and even Palestinian Israelis. In other words, Palestinians who have Israeli citizenship. So who are the people? Well, any piece of land like this, which has been invaded by dozens of different empires, over the years, 
and was also on the main trade routes between Egypt and Mesopotamia and Greece and Rome, is going to be a very mixed up bunch of people. They're going to have um, a sort of genetic inheritance from different places. Um, you know, a friend of mine from Bethlehem is a, a young guy called Zach Zabella. Zabella is an Italian name. His great 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 grandfather was one of the Crusaders who never went home. So for 900 years, the Sabella family have been a Catholic family in Bethlehem. His father, Bernard, is a member of the Palestinian Legislative Assembly. Not that it ever is allowed to do anything. So traders and conquerors have left their mark. And, and because these are frontier communities, so there's always going to be people passing through. And even the, even the Jewish people themselves, even in the Old Testament, the way they tell their story, they came from somewhere else. It's not like they'd always been here. You know, the story of Abraham is that Abraham came from somewhere else. And this was the place that God said, okay, um, you and your descendants can now live here. So there's a, it, um, even embedded in the biblical narrative is this sense that um, we are not the Aboriginal people, not, which means, of course, the people from the beginning, Aboriginal meaning means the ones there from the start. Um, Jewish people are not indigenous in terms of their own story. Yeah. Uh, there's a television program where you're really from. Yeah, where are you really from? Yes. And yeah. And and where are you really from and why should that matter and in what ways does it matter and so on. Yeah. I mean, um, I didn't grow up with any strong sense of American identity, but it turns out the Jenkses came from the US. Not I mean ultimately from England. But that was back in the early 1600s. We only we only turned up in Australia in the 1890s, um, and so my great great grandfather, who's buried in Lismore, was actually born in Massachusetts. Okay, that's that's the switchover, and he ended up dying in Lismore at the age of 53 or something. So mm -hmm. he's buried there. So in that 50 year period, the family moved from one continent to another, but um, but that left no trace on my upbringing because I grew up in a very sort of British royalist kind of tradition and so the Jenks bit sort of never got a look in. So there are two categories of people that of course we've got to deal with. First is the Jewish people and there's, there's absolutely no question the Jewish people have been uh, living in this land, some of them at least have been living in this land um, since about a thousand BC. Okay. Because it's not, it's not continuous, and obviously there's nobody alive now that was there 3,000 years ago, but you know, there is a continuous history of, of a group of people living in Canaan, living in Palestine, living in Eretz Yisrael, who identified in some sense as Jewish. Now even the word Jewish is a problem because nobody in the Old Testament called themselves Jewish. Okay, Jewish comes from tribe of Judah. And, and in the Greek period, the little, the little rump that was left around Jerusalem was called Judea. And so Jews and Judea and Ju Judaism is uh, derived from the word Judean and Judea. And that's, that's what was left of the southern kingdom around about the time of the Greeks and the Romans. Um, Israel, further to the north, still in the land of the biblical land, Israel kind of morphed into the Samaritans who are still there but there's less than a thousand of them in the whole country okay. whereas there's like six million Jews so the Samaritans don't have much cultural influence when there when there's so few of them okay so the Jews have certainly been there in ancient times they have roots that run very deep into the land and the land is central to who they understand themselves to be because they believe God gave this land to their ancestors as part of their covenant. Um, it's also true that even in ancient times there were large numbers of Jewish people living outside the land in um, what we call the diaspora. And in other words, uh, even so, so Paul for instance, Paul was a Jew but he's from Tarsus, he's from southern Turkey. But he grew up Jewish, he's a member of the Pharisee movement and so on. So we know that there were Jewish communities in Babylon, through in Egypt, throughout Greece and so on. 
in ancient times and of course right down to modern times and one of the population one of the things that happened in 1948 through to the early 50s is that the ancient Jewish communities in Damascus and Cairo and Baghdad and so on um, largely relocated into Israel because in the given the conflict that was happening between the Arab world and the Jewish state it suddenly became kind of difficult to be Jewish in Baghdad where it hadn't been a problem to be Jewish in Baghdad for 3,000 years or two and a half thousand years but in the last 60, 70 years, became problematic. Okay, so, the, and one of the uh, um, one of the divides within the contemporary Israel is between Sephardic Jews, which basically are the Jews from the Middle East, and Ashkenazi Jews, which are the Jews basically from Germany, and Poland and Eastern Europe, Russia and so on, and. Um, the uh, Ashkenazi Jews, sorry, the Sephardic Jews, and particularly those that came from the Middle East, tend to speak Arabic. They do Arabic cooking. Culturally, they're they're exactly the same as as their Arab neighbours, because for more than a thousand years their families have lived in the Middle East in an Arabic-speaking world. Whereas the ones that have come from Europe tend to be more um, German, Polish. Remember, sort of Prussia. Poland, you know, our labels start to break down a bit, but that that sort of German, Polish, and sort of Russian um, um, expression of Judaism, and and that's the group which really drove the the idea of creating a Jewish state. It wasn't a project that appealed to the local Jews living in the Middle East. It was European Jews who said, "Hmm, everybody else is getting a homeland. Germany's united. The Italians have united." Well, um, can we have uh, what's going to happen to us? Okay, and and so, the, but that was very much a sort of European Ashkenazi thing. So from ancient times, uh, Jewish community has has always been deeply attached to Jerusalem, but not necessarily living there, like the American Jews who think it's a great idea, but thank you very much, they'll stay in New York and just send their donations. Pilgrimage to Jerusalem has always been. A central part of Jewish identity, not always possible given transport and the dangers of travel, but certainly um, uh, in ancient times and in modern times, people would make pilgrimage to Jerusalem in particular. Uh, the Jewish population was suppressed by the Romans as punishment for a series of Jewish uprisings, 66 to 73, 115 to 118, 132 to 135, by the end of which the Romans said, enough, this is not going to be a Jewish place anymore, we're just going to call it Palestine, we're going to build a pagan temple in Jerusalem, and we're going to rename Jerusalem as Aelia Capitolina, and Jews will be forbidden from setting foot on the land. Mm -hmm. Okay? Because the Romans had went, enough, <laughs> enough, three revolts in less than 100 years, this has got to stop. This course, despite the policy, there were always some Jewish people living there. They did not vanish. In fact, one of the interesting questions is, what did happen to all the Jewish people living in the Holy Land? And one big part of the answer is, actually, they became Christian. They became part of the Byzantine Empire, and then later on they became Muslims, and we now call them Palestinians, but they're actually descendants of the ancient Jews who never went away. Neither the Palestinians nor the Israelis want to hear that. Okay? It's a bit like the French and the Germans in Alsace-Lorraine. And of course embedded deeply in the Jewish consciousness, particularly at Passover time, is this prayer next year in Jerusalem. So Jerusalem has a... And there's nothing in the Christian religion which equates to the role that Jerusalem has within this Jewish faith. One of the differences between Christianity and, and, say, Judaism is that we're not attached to a particular people and we're not attached to a particular piece of land. We're an international um, sort of movement, cosmopolitan movement, where, as Paul says, you know, in Christ there's neither Jew nor Greek, slave or free, male or female, those sort of cultural things no longer count. So that's one way of describing the Jewish population. And I'll come back to numbers in a minute. But there's absolutely no question that Jewish people 
have um, a deep attachment to the land and have always been part of this, or always, for the last 3,000 years at least, have been part of the land. Palestinians, on the other hand, make similar claims. They are still the majority of the people in the land that we're talking about. Now, we'll talk about that a bit more in a second, but the Palestinians were the majority back in 100 years ago. They were the majority in 1948. They are still the majority. And therein lies a real demographic problem for Israel. Because if the Arabs are the majority, I can't give them the vote. Okay? That's why there was a petition plan. Unless you cut the land up and exclude some people artificially from counting, if you're just going to count every human being over the age of 18, then it's an Arab country. Okay? And Israel doesn't want to be an Arab country. It wants to be a Jewish country. But most of the people in its boundaries are not Jewish. So therein lies a problem. Now, it's, it's similar but totally different from the issues we might have with land rights and so on. Um, the indigenous population of Australia makes up probably less than 5% of the population. They can never vote us out of parliament. Okay? They just don't have the numbers. So we can be as generous, hopefully, as we might imagine being with land rights and education and so on, and we don't do a good job at it, but it's not like we have a visceral fear that they might outnumber us, because actually we did it to them. We swamped the place with white fellas, and we took it over. Okay, <clears throat> so it's a similar thing, but the but the maths are different. So Palestinians are a majority. There are almost as many Palestinian refugees. Like there's something like five million <coughs> refugees registered with the UN who are Palestinians living in in Jordan and in um, Lebanon and in a few other places, but particularly Jordan and Lebanon, who want to go home. But Israel doesn't want them back. That would only make the voting numbers even worse. Okay? Not my <laughs> because of the ethnic cleansing that took place in 1948. I'll come to that in a second. But 1948, um, about 400 Arab villages were destroyed and bulldozed. So they could say that, nothing to see here, no, no Arabs around here. Okay, and those people fled, mostly at gunpoint. Some of them were killed, but others fled with the idea that they'll, they'll go across the river into Jordan, they'll duck up into Lebanon, stay with rallies for a couple of weeks. When it all settles down, they'll come home. But Israel never let them to come back home because it wanted to reduce the Arab population artificially in 1948. Um, and the, the one part of the country they didn't do so well at was in the Galilee. And the, the, um, the Palestinians, or the Arabs, as the Israelis like to call them, thank you, the Palestinians continue to be the majority of the population in the Galilee. And so there are consistent efforts by the Israeli government to, um, with, with benefits and, and subsidies and grants and tax exemptions and so on, to encourage Jewish people to move up and create um, some residential districts in the north. Okay, because obviously the further north you get, the closer you're getting to Lebanon and Syria, and the Palestinian community is more intact. That's also where most of the Christians in Israel are to be found, because guess what? Christians are not Jews. So if you're a Christian in Palestine, you're going to be an Arab. And most likely you're going to be in the Galilee, because that's where the Christian was where the Arab population is strongest and it's also where the Christian presence is strongest. In Lebanon, remember that officially, Lebanon is 50% Christian and Galilee is just South Lebanon. So the families in Lebanon have all, sorry, the families in North, in Galilee, Northern Israel, have, have very closely connected with their relatives in, 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 in Southern Lebanon. And, it's a, and we find the stories of Jesus and he goes to visit uh, uh, when he goes to the coast, he goes to the coastal regions of Tyre and Sidon. That's an ancient dynamic. That if you if you hang out near the Sea of Galilee, you're going to the beach. You're heading to southern Lebanon. Now there's an international border there, so that messes that up. 
So there are, <clears throat> there are something like 4 million, maybe more these days, uh, Palestinian refugees outside the land. As I mentioned earlier, the Palestinians are not people who moved in last week, um, despite some Jewish people trying to tell me that on the streets. They only came here for jobs since 1948. There weren't any Arabs here before then. I mean, no, that's just not blazingly untrue. They are the descendants of the ancient peoples of the land. They're probably the descendants of Jewish people who converted to Christianity and then subsequently, in most cases, converted to Islam. Um, their ethnicity is local. And the, the, the strongest evidence of that, if you look at the Hapla mapping, the DNA mapping, which has been done, the groups in the world which are closest together are Syrians, Israelis, and Palestinians. They are the same people, genetically. They're exactly the same people. Would you have to repeat the name? The no, not us, Syrians. 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 People from Syria who just love Israel, as you might remember. Okay, Syrians, Damascus, Syrians, Palestinians and Israelis have the closest correlation on the DNA mapping of any groups in the world. They are the same people. And that's what the Bible says. A wandering Aramean was my father. What are the Arameans? The Arameans are the people of Syria. So the Jewish people and the Palestinian people, who are probably actually Jewish in their origins, are all of them descendants of the Arameans, and it's the same population group. So their ethnicity is local, but for the Palestinians, their identity is Arab. That does not mean that they came or their ancestors came from Saudi Arabia, but it means that in the middle of the 7th century, when the Arab conquest, Islamic conquest, took over the Middle East, these people decided to speak Arabic and call themselves Arab because that was a really good move economically. Okay, and so the Bible was translated from Aramaic into Arabic in the seventh and eighth century. Um, so, um, so they're Arabic in the in the in the sense that their culture and their language is Arabic, but but the Palestinians have a very distinct identity. Palestinians and Syrians and Lebanese have a again a shared, um, their dialect of Arabic is different from Saudi Arabic and different from the Gulf, or different from North Egypt, North Africa. So culturally, linguistically and so on, um, the whole world for them became Arabic in the seventh century. So even though the majority of the population were Christian at the time, they all said, okay guys, obviously the empire's changed, we're not going to speak Greek anymore with the Byzantines, we're now going to speak Arabic. And these days, of course, it's English. It's, it's, it's in a similar kind of position. So when we say they're Arabs, they're only Arabs culturally, in the same way the Egyptians have been in Egypt for 10,000 years. Okay, they're not Arabs, but we nonetheless refer to the Egyptians as part of the Arab world, because they speak Arabic. It's like being in, 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 in the sort of French sphere of influence, you know, French Africa, British Africa and so on. It's that kind of a thing. So you've got the Jews and the Palestinians that have been there forever. And their genetic history is way more complicated than any of them actually want to acknowledge. I almost repeated Jesus' experience in Nazareth one time when, remember, he got into trouble in the synagogue and they wanted to drag him out and stone him. While I was talking at Christchurch, interesting name, Anglican Church in Nazareth. And the qu one of the first questions afterwards was, um, so uh, were our people here in the time of Jesus? And I said, well, yes, your people were here. Your ancestors were here in the time of Jesus, but they didn't call themselves Arabs. Because the Arab conquest hadn't happened. Your ancestors who lived here 2,000 years ago were Jewish. Mm -mm. They didn't want to hear that. Okay, the place erupted. That was a very unwelcome message. Okay, so now we fast forward to about the same time as of as sort of British settlement is happening here in Australia. So about two hundred years ago, and that particular image, of course, is an image of the uh, of the French campaigns, the, uh, the wars led by Napoleon when he invaded Egypt in about. 1795 or 1798 or something like that. 
great backdrop for a battle. You know, the pyramids have seen a lot over the years. Okay, so what was Napoleon doing? So for three years, he's invading North Africa, Egypt, captures most of Palestine, comes right up as far as Akko or Acre, and he has like a two-year siege of Acre, and he never quite manages to capture the city. Why doesn't he manage to capture the city? Because it's on the Mediterranean, and the British are bringing in supplies by the shipload to make sure Napoleon doesn't succeed. So why is Napoleon there? Well, he's gone to Egypt to capture the Middle East, to promote and, def and defend French economic interests, and to deny the British access to India. Okay. The British, of course, don't like that at all. He takes along a whole bunch of scientists and lots of really important things happen, including the discovery of the Rosetta Stone, which allowed us to crack the hieroglyphics for the first time and actually translate ancient Egyptian texts. And he ended up with this prolonged but unsuccessful siege at Akko or Acre. So that's Napoleon. So he takes it upon himself to just go and invade Egypt. Because that's what European powers did in those days. We didn't have a rules-based international order. If you were big enough and dirty enough and mean enough, you could do it. Whether you were Spain or Portugal or... And, and of course the late comers were places like Italy and Germany, which were not unified until the 1870s. But they quickly scrambled to go and get little bits of Equatorial Africa or PNG or whatever, because you had to, be, had to have an overseas empire in order to be a serious European power. Meanwhile, the Brits, of course, are not at all impressed that the French, the froggies, are causing mischief in Egypt. So his invasion alarmed the British, so there's a response. Now, if there's one thing that the British and the Germans have in common, it's their dislike of the French. Okay? We tend to forget, because of the World War I and II, we tend to forget that's not normally how we line up. Historically, we line up with the Germans. I mean, our royal family comes from where? Okay? Uh, sure, they renamed themselves during the war as the House of Windsor, but that's just a paint and paint job, really. Okay. So the English government and the Prussian, this is even before the unification of Germany. So the King of Prussia and the English government decided to set up a joint Anglo-Prussian bishopric the bishopric of St. James, which is kind of interesting. Um, and so, uh, and this, this was to be shared. The first bishop was going to be Church of England, the second bishop was going to be Lutheran, the third bishop, Church of England, and so on. Um, we liked it so much we never gave them a turn, <laughs> which didn't do much for the trust between the Germans. But the point was, this was the British and the French collaborating under the guise of religion to stop the French and also the Russians. Don't forget the Crimean War in another 15 years' time. Okay. 1845, they established the first Anglican church in Jerusalem, Christ Church. There's that word again, at Jaffa Gate. Um, 1853 to 56, you got the Crimean War, the first mechanized war in history. And what's that about? It's about the French this time the French and the British in alliance to stop the Russians. The Ottoman Empire is in decline. Russia starts to expand and modernize, industrialize. And the French and the British don't want Russia spreading down through the Black Sea, past the Bosphorus, and pushing into the Mediterranean. That's our sphere of influence. Ruskies keep out. So now we support the Ottomans and against the Russians because a weak Ottoman Empire is better for the British and the French than a powerful Russian Empire. This sound like yesterday's news headlines? <laughs> hmm. Amongst the other things the British did, 1865 they established the Palestine Exploration Fund, the world's oldest archaeological organization. It was actually an undercover mapping project to map the whole of Palestine for the British Army so when they attacked the Ottomans They'd had really good maps and details of the population in each village, what the agriculture was, what the industries were, and so on. And of course, in 1917, we have the Balfour Declaration. That's just 100 years ago. Towards the end of the First World War, 
and um, the British um, promised to create a homeland for the Jewish people in Palestine. And of course, a couple of years later, they managed to get from the League of Nations a mandate to manage Palestine on behalf of the international community. So the power games are going on. The Russians, of course, are still there. They've been a bit distracted by 1917 with the Russian Revolution. Let's go back to 1844. This is um, an extra, talking about advice given to the, to the Home Office, or the British Foreign Office, by the British Consul um, in Jerusalem. And I'll just read out the bits in um, red. The British Consul warned London that, quote, the Russians could in one night during Easter arm 10,000 pilgrims within the walls of Jerusalem and seize the city. This is in 1844, a year before Christchurch is opened. This is the kind of political advice. The Russians, the French, and the English, in cahoots with the Germans, are competing. The Russians are Orthodox, the, the French are Catholic, and the, uh, the English and the Germans are seen as Protestant. Okay? And, and this, this, so there's this international, imperial, religious competition going on. I've just had a book chapter published on that stuff, actually. Meanwhile, there's the emergence, for the first time, of something called Zionism. And Zion, of course, is an ancient Jewish word for Jerusalem. Evangelicals in England, and nowhere else in Europe, but evangelicals in England promoted the concept of Jewish restoration, that Jesus would not come back until the Jewish people were regathered and were all put back into the homeland where they were meant to be. And until all the Jews were sent home, um, Jesus could not return. Now that's a nutty idea. Okay? And, it's, and, and we can see the consequences of it 100 years later. Okay? It's a nutty idea. It's, a, it's an extremist, sort of fanatical idea. So um, they were... They actually then sold that idea to their Jewish friends and the Jewish people in England started to adopt this idea of what was called Zionism and originally Restorationism. At the same time, as I mentioned earlier, through the 1870s and through 1880s, there's a growing sense that every language group should have its own country. Yeah? For the people who spoke French, there's France. For the people who spoke German, there's Germany and so on. For people who spoke Italian, there's Italy had to be united and be one kingdom and so on. And, and of course, um, there were lots of Jewish people living in Europe. They're beginning to finally being emancipated after centuries of living under very restrictive um, anti-Semitic laws. They're finally being emancipated and they're saying, so where's our country? Okay, when they were told, well, you need to go back where you came from and you can have their country. There's nobody there anyway. You go and have that country. Okay, which of course wasn't true. The first Zionist Congress was held in 1897. Uh, it was a project coordinated by Theodore Herzl, and um, and he's in many ways he's the founder of modern, well he's the founder of Zionism, and in many ways he's the the trigger for the creation of the sort of Jewish homeland back in Palestine. They weren't looking at Palestine originally. They were very European. They were looking at somewhere in South America and they're looking somewhere in East Africa, or as a last resort, going to Palestine. But Palestine was not their preferred place for a Jewish colony. It was also a consideration of going to the Kimberley in those days. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, they were very, it was very much a sort of colonial mindset. Let's go and just take a bit of someone else's land, and we'll call it a Jewish colony. As That's what happened in North America. It's what we did here. That's what happened in New Zealand. I mean, it was, it was in the water it seems, at the time. So it's very much a sort of European nationalist colonial mindset that's operating here. Indeed, the fund that was set up by the Rockefeller family in the US was simply called the Fund for the Jewish Colonization of Palestine. You couldn't use language like that anymore. But 150 years ago, that wasn't a problem. So the Rockefellers and, and other wealthy Jewish families we're putting money in for the purchase of land in order to enable the Jewish colonization of Palestine. One of my friends, uh, Jewish friends in Israel, um, their family farm uh, is leased for 100 years, just gone into its second 100-year lease, 
And this was land acquired by this money from the fund for the Jewish colonization of Palestine. And this, this poster is particularly interesting. In fact, if you look at the fine print, it actually tells you it's, pr it's, pr it's printed by the Zionist Travel Bureau in 1935. Okay, it's a Jewish poster designed to promote people coming to visit Palestine. And look, it's an empty land. There's nobody there. But the people that aren't there have built the city of Jerusalem with the Dome of the Rock in the middle. I mean, it's a, they're undoing their own propaganda, of course. But this was the recognised symbol of Palestine, and the name of the land was Palestine. Even for Jewish people promoting Jewish colonisation, it was come to Palestine. Okay? It's easy to forget that it only became Israel on the 15th of May in 1948, and it was a very narrow vote as to which name they would use. But now it's, oh, it's obviously Israel. So the, the propaganda line was, we'll take a land without people and give it to a people without land. But this was not a land without people. As indeed the British mapping survey, we've got detailed census data from the second half of the 19th century. We know exactly how many Palestinians were living in each village and there were virtually no Jews in the land at the time. So it was not an empty land, it was a land that had people. So the project was to acquire land. Most of the land was not in private ownership. It was held by very wealthy individuals who were mostly living in Damascus, Beirut or Constantinople, Istanbul. So the agents from the American Jewish Fund simply went and bought the properties. So it became Jewish land. And it is. Vast tracts of what is now Israel are actually owned by the Jewish National Fund, which is a perpetual trust. It will lease the land to a Jewish family, never to a Palestinian family, but it will never sell the land. Okay? <coughs> so even if Israel ceased to exist for whatever reason, the Jewish National Fund will still own 90% of the country. So this was about acquiring land from absentee owners and of course it did have a problem. When you bought the estate, you also acquired the villagers and the villagers who lived there. It was a feudal system. And the British, during the British mandate period, started to introduce land reform because they realised the Palestinians might have been there for 500, 700, 2000 years, whatever, but they had no concept of land ownership because they always just lived on a farm owned by some wealthy guy that never turned up. But now the wealthy guy was Jewish and he was saying, actually, you guys can leave now. I'm going to bring in Jewish workers who will work the farm. So the acquisition of land also became an act of dispossession and displacement. The British eventually gave the Palestinians title to the land where their house stood, but not to the fields. That's helpful. Of course, they were promoting Jewish migration. That's fine. Um, I'll come back to that in a minute. It was actually a very secular and socialist program, as much inspired by Marxism and the Soviet Revolution as anything else. And of course, the kibbutz movement was the sort of classic expression of that. And all of this is long before the Holocaust. It has nothing to do with the Holocaust. Okay, although the Holocaust is today the largest single justification for the dispossession of the Palestinians. A, it was, just, it was a Holocaust done by the Germans, not by the Palestinians. And B, this all happened 50 years, 100 years before the Holocaust. So, 100 years ago, the Turks have surrendered. The Ottoman Empire is over. And so the, uh, the powers, the world powers, which is primarily France and Britain, with the um, emerging American power in the background, decide to carve up the Middle East between them. Egypt more or less becomes independent, but under British kind of influence, because we control the Suez Canal. And Turkey uh, was left to be a secular um, Tur yeah, Turkish Republic, Ataturk and all that stuff. The French carve out a big chunk in southern Turk, south 
southeastern Turkey and down through the coastal area of Syria through to Lebanon, which is under direct French control. And behind that is another area of an independent Arab state in the French sphere of influence, which is basically Syria, what today is Syria. Um, below that, the Brits got all the oil fields. Oh, that's ours. What a smart choice that was. So we got Iraq and Iran, or mostly, mostly what today is Iraq, Kuwait, those sort of places. And you can see there on the map, Palestine was meant to be under international control and would not be controlled by either the British or the French, but by the League of Nations, except the British would have a little tiny zone around Haifa, which would they would be in direct control. But when General Allenby captured Jerusalem in 1918, and the French ambassador turned up to said, turned up to say, well, good, so we're going to run this together. And he said, I am the only power in this city. And the British refused to hand it up, to share power with the French. So the British took Palestine as an area under a, under a League of Nations mandate, but it was not an international zone. The French, so the French are restricted to Lebanon and Syria, and the British are what today we call, we're in what today we call Israel, Palestine, Jordan, um, the Gulf states, and Iraq. That was the British sphere of influence. Okay? And these lines are being drawn by bureaucrats in London and Paris without any attention to the local cultural dynamics of the people living there. And with a very thick pen, which means sometimes it's not actually sure which side of the line a particular village is in because the pen they used was so thick. Okay. So you can see we're setting this up to be a mess. With the benefit of hindsight, and even at the time, probably, this was never going to work. Okay. Here's the Balfour Declaration, and it's just this one little paragraph um, which changed everything. November 2nd, 1917, and there's a larger version of the key paragraph here. His Majesty's Government view with favour the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people. Not a Jewish state, but a national home, and will make their best endeavours to facilitate the achievement of this object, it being clearly understood nothing shall be done which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities. Well, we did really well with that part, didn't we? So this was a, a gift to the um, Jewish community from the British government the British government's strategic idea was that if there was a Jewish colony in southern Palestine, close to Egypt, it would always be pro-British, and that would enable us to control access to the oil fields and to India. So it's all about imperial power gain. It's not about um, pro-Jewish settlement, actually. So the tensions arise. The Palestinians begin to realise that the Brits are giving their country away. And if you remember Lawrence of Arabia, he was working with the Arabs, uh, with the family who eventually became, I mean, um, Emir Abdullah, he eventually became King Abdullah, the first King of Jordan. And um, he was promising them independence as a gift from the British. And the British were promising a Jewish homeland to the Jewish supporters who were investing in the war effort and so on. So the Palestinians eventually twigged. This was actually not a very good idea. A lot of Jews moving into the country and they're taking all our land and they don't employ any of our kids on their farms. Like this is not going to work well. There's increasing levels of Jewish migration, violence both ways between the two communities and the Brits are struggling to keep the whole thing under control and they spend a huge amount of money and took large numbers of casualties in the next 30 years or so while they tried to manage the violence to eventually they decided to get out of the business of running Palestine. And they developed an exit strategy which was then interrupted by the Second World War. And again, all of this is before the death camps in Auschwitz and other places. So just a quick heads up as what was going on. The original petition plan in 1948 was that the bits in um, 
get the tribe. So the bits in this color, the reddish browny color, they were the areas that had substantial Jewish population or Jewish ownership of land, and they were going to uh, they were going to be the Jewish state within the partition arrangement, and the rest of the country was to be the Arab state of Palestine. And as you can see, these would have been really interesting, happy little crossing points as people move one to the other. Um, the, the plan was adopted, UN Resolution 181, in November 1949, to take effect by December the following year. Actually, I think that should be 1947, sorry. The petition was rejected by the Palestinians and all the Arab states who said, no, we're not going to chop up the country and give half of it away. Not the petition ejected. Yes, okay. Yes, it was ejected and rejected. Yes, good, yes. Um, so the petition plan was, was rejected. They, they refused to accept this plan. Um, in 14th of May 1948, the uh, um, Jewish political parties declared independence and were immediately recognised by the United States as an independent nation. And of course, the war broke out, which the Israelis called the War of Independence, and which the Palestinians call the Nakba, which means the catastrophe. So just quickly heading up, what's been happening here over the previous uh, period, this is in the um, period in the 1920s and 1930s. Interesting, there's not numbers so much as percentages. Percentage, the large percentages of people coming, this is pre-war, coming from Poland and Russia, like there's 66% of the migration in 1922 to 29 is coming from the areas where the concentration camps would be. So the Nazi thing hasn't happened, but anti-Semitism certainly has. Okay, and they're getting out. Um, 1936, 37, now it's harder to get out because, but you know, so you're not getting out of Russia, uh, but there's still significant percentages coming out of um, both Germany and Poland. People just getting out, and Austria is included here. Uh, obviously, during the war, um, very, very difficult uh, situation. Mm. Uh, and then we, and, well, the war is right through to here. Okay. So that's just the migration patterns from the 1920s to the mid-1940s. Um, between 1933 and 1948, you've got the uh, so-called illegal immigration, where the British said, we've got to stop bringing so many Jews in here. This is causing one hell of a fight with the Palestinians, and British soldiers are dying. So they banned any more Jewish migration, but the ships kept coming. So the British took them off and put them in concentration camps rather than let them go to Palestine. Okay, But about 70,000 still managed to get through. So the end result, and this is not, these maps are, have been uh, criticised in some ways, but they, they give the bigger overall story. In 1946, prior to petition, the dark areas are the areas that were basically Palestinian land and the white areas were Jewish-owned land. The UN plan was more or less based on that, but even so, it gave all this Palestinian land to Israel. Okay. So the Jewish the petition plan was that where the concentration of Arabs were strongest, in the Galilee, the West Bank and in Gaza, that was to be Palestinian and the rest was to be Jewish. What actually happened is over here, whereas as a result of the war, right through to 1967, um, this is the West Bank, so-called West Bank area, and down here is Gaza. And the rest is the modern shape of Israel. Because in 1967, Israel captured the whole lot and immediately had the demographic problem. Now that we've captured everything from the Mediterranean to the Jordan, what do we do with the Arabs? They could no longer just put them in trucks and ship them over the border. That was not going to work in 1967. And also, the Palestinians, having seen what happened to their parents in 1948, when they went to Beirut for the weekend, thinking they'd come back next week, they said, we're not leaving. We're going to stay put, because if we, as soon as we leave the country, they'll shut the door behind us. Yes, Terry? Okay. Now, on that third one, I mean, yeah. Is it understand the dark bit, but can you just talk a bit about Gaza, how that's, that's so separate and isolated? Ah, the reason it's, well, you see even over here, 
uh, it was always going to be a Palestinian. What happened in 1948 was Gaza was captured by Egypt. So when the Arab states did attack Israel, the Egyptians succeeded in capturing this little bit down here, which is the Gaza Strip. So until 1967, it stayed under Egyptian control. The Jordanians, uh, they had the, they had the uh, Jordania, sorry, they had the, their army, or well, their key soldiers were called the Arab Legion. They were British trained and British led. They were the you know, people that had worked with, you know, for the Brits for decades. And they actually did very, very well. They, they retained, all of this area that was meant to be Palestinian, and they retained most of it, including the old city of Jerusalem. And when the, when the Jewish forces requested a ceasefire, which the Jordanians agreed to, it was because the Jewish forces were 30 minutes away from running out of ammunition. Had they not agreed to the ceasefire, we'd have, have a totally different story. Okay? So there were some strategic tipping points here and there. So this was under Jordanian rule between 1948 and 1967. This was under Egyptian rule. And then as a result of the Oslo Accords, which are 96 or say roughly 2000, um, Gaza and the West Bank is under the authority of the Palestinian Authority, but is divided into areas A, B and C. And um, area A is under uh, Palestinian control of everything except foreign affairs. Area B um, is uh, shared civil and military control between Israel and Palestinians. And Area C is Palestinian land under exclusively Israeli control. Okay. And Area C in particular is where they've moved in several hundred thousand settlers, illegal settlers, to try and change the Jewish demographic in the West Bank. So all the controversy about settlements is pri they're primarily in what's called Area C which is traditional Palestinian land, which Israel has no intention of giving back. Okay. So the areas that are actually under uh, exclusive, more or less exclusive Palestinian control are these little fragmented areas. And it's beginning to look a lot like Bantustan arrangements in South Africa. With the, you know, we'll give you autonomy in your little black neighborhood, but we'll still stay in charge. So we can argue about what these maps, ha I mean, in what sense was this, was this sort of desert area, mostly sort of Bedouin territory, in what sense was that Palestinian land, but then in what sense did it become Israel in 1948 and so on. But the, the general trend is clear. They talk about a two-state solution, where would they <laughs> Well, when they talk about a two-state solution and the 1967 boundaries actually mean the boundaries that were in effect from 1948 to 1967, or the armistice in 1949. So the, when they say return to the 67 boundaries, they mean the boundaries prior to the Six Day War in June 1967. And that means all this area here, including the grey bits, in other words, all this stuff here, would, would come back to being um, Palestinian, including East Jerusalem, and as would the Gaza Strip. But um, the, uh, but the reality is um, Israel has put so many settlers into this and put highways and so on all through the West Bank, which only Israeli cars are allowed to use, not Palestinian cars are allowed to use. So they've sliced and diced the countryside in a way that makes it, in most people's opinion, impossible for there to be a viable Palestinian state. So, there is, so if you're not going to have a two-state solution, then you have a one-state solution. And a one-state will either be democratic or an apartheid state, based on your ethnicity. I have joked with my Palestinian friends, why don't you just all become Jewish? It's only a tiny little operation, just all become Jewish. Okay. They don't think I'm funny. Okay. So 1948 to 60, this gets back to the refugees, a massive uh, ethnic cleansing exercise um, where about 800,000 Palestinians were driven out of the country 
In some cases, they went to what's now called the West Bank. So they've become refugees twice, as it were. Um, other cases, they went further over to Jordan and so on. 50% of the population of Jordan is, are actually Palestinians. Okay? The Queen of Jordan is actually a Palestinian person. Because again, these are the same people. These borders are created by the British. They're not, they don't reflect ancient realities. So massive ethnic cleansing, about 800,000 Arabs get pushed out. Massive inflow of Jewish migrants, we'll come back to that, but roughly 800,000 Jewish people moved in, particularly from Jewish communities around the Arab world. Uh, so these, these new waves of people came from post-Holocaust Europe, and then a little bit later, Jewish communities in the Arab world. In May 1948, there were only 650,000 Jews living in Palestine, and between 1948 and 51, another 688 Jewish immigrants came. So the Jewish population doubled in about three years, from 600,000 to 1.2 million. The record year was 1949, when almost 250,000 migrants came in that one year. Okay. Uh, and then the next big in surge was between, in the late 60s and early 70s, there was a large group of Russian Jews that were allowed out and, and came to Israel. And many of the people that are now in power in the political government, the state of Israel, are in fact what they call Russian Jews, Russian emigres, who are very attached to Russia, culturally and so on, speak Russian, and um, their story is not the story of the 1930s and the 1940s and the 1950s. Their Israeli story starts around 1970. And they're basically economic migrants. Um, okay, the current population, Israel's latest figures, looked it up last night, about 8.5 million people in Israel as of yesterday, 75% Jewish, 20% uh, Arab, another 5% they can't quite describe. Um, and, but very small. So you can see that Roughly the Arabs, and it's been a fairly consistent number for a number of years, the Palestinian population within Israel sits around 20%. In fact, uh, the current Israel president uh, has, has gave a very interesting speech a couple of years ago, he talked about the four tribes of Israel. And what he's talking about, he said each of these groups are about 20, 25% of the population. He said if you if you go to a year one class, you'll see the future of our country. 20% of our people are secular Jews. Uh, uh, he's talking in terms of four. So roughly, roughly sort of 25% um, or whatever of the population of Israel are secular Jews. Roughly 25% are religious Jews. Roughly 25% are settlers. And roughly 25% are Palestinians. And those four tribes hate each other, don't trust each other, and none of them ever will have a majority. So he said in 25, 50 years time, what you're seeing in the demographics of the five-year-old population, that's the destiny for Israel. Four tribes of people who don't trust each other will be the state of Israel. And that's not even counting the Palestinians on the West Bank and Gaza. How is the government represented? It's very right wing. It's dominated by an alliance between the religious and the settlers. And that's why it's not signing peace deals. That's why it's promoting um, illegal Jewish settlement in the West Bank, because that's what those voters want. And the secular Jews, um, and the, the other thing in all this is that the, in terms of demographics, religious Jews tend to have eight or nine children each per couple. Uh, Muslims tend to have 10 to 12 kids per couple. Secular Jews have one or two. And Christian Palestinians have one or two. So the two groups that could get on really well, and do get on really well, Christian Palestinians and secular Jews, are, are breeding themselves out of existence. Mm -hmm. And the two groups that are most intransigent and are not interested in compromise are making babies like there's nothing else to do. Okay, so again, the structural dynamics are very scary. So Israel has a population of 8.5, of which uh, about 2 million or so would be Palestinians. 
Palestine. Well, Hamas is a, it's, it's part of the Palestinian population. Um, it's a very extreme sort of Islamic, so the PLO or Fatah tends to be secular nationalist. Hamas is a um, sort of Islamic nationalist movement. Actually, Hamas was set up by the Israelis, funded by the Israelis to undermine the PLO. Like the Americans set up the sort of Mujahideen in Afghanistan to, to sort of fight the Soviet invasion. Hamas was actually a deliberate, deliberate program by the Israelis to undermine and fragment the um, Palestinian national resistance and it's turned into this horrible thing. So you've got eight and a half Israelis of which about two million would be uh, Arabs, Palestinians. You've got another 5.3 or so million just in West Bank and Gaza. Okay. So you take the two million Arabs out of the Israel number, put that on top, then um, you've got um, you've got you've got a population of about six and a half million Israelis, and you've got a population of about seven point three Palestinians. This is between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean. That'd be like having fifteen million people on the north coast. <coughs> Yeah, by according to official Israeli numbers, the end of last year, on their project, on their projections, population between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean would be exactly 50-50. I think it's actually not worked out quite that even for them, and it's projected that by 2035, there'll be basically a 55-45. Um, and this is not counting the four or five million refugees living outside the country. You can see why Israel doesn't want them to come back. Sure, let's just throw another five million Palestinians into the mix. That's not going to happen. Okay. So we have a wicked problem. And I don't mean it's evil, but we have a wicked problem, a complex problem. There is no neat solution to this. You have incompatible aspirations from intransigent opposing groups. Okay, it will not accept any simple resolution. Revolves around three things in particular. Land, identity, and identity has been also hooked up with religion, largely. Palestinians are overwhelmingly Muslim these days. Um, and of course the Israeli Jews are Jewish. They might be secular Jews, but they're Jewish. And power. How is power going to be? How are we going to exercise our leaders? How are we going to elect our excellent thing? How are we going to elect our leaders? And how is power going to be structured and exercised? Okay. Um, and all the toing and froing with the Americans and the and the quartet and everything else is, is working with these three variables. What do we do about the land? What do we do about identity? And and so on. and then how is actual power going to be exercised. This guy is Jeff Halper, originally an American Jew. He now lives in Israel. He's rather left-wing. He's the chair of the Israeli Committee Against House Demolition. In other words, when the Israeli army demolishes a Palestinian house, he and his Jewish friends come around and rebuild it. Okay, brave man, stubborn man. You know, not a popular man. When he was in Sydney a year or two ago, the local Jewish community didn't want to meet with him because he's not Jewish enough. In other words, he didn't align with their attitudes towards the occupation. So he's an Israeli peace activist, and, and I've met him and had some conversations with him. Amongst his comments are, um, Israel has to stop thinking of itself as a, um, as a heritage park for wealthy American Jews to make them feel good about being Jewish by having this lovely kind of Jewish museum in the Middle East. Another one of his comments was, Israel has to join the Middle East. It has to stop being part of Europe and America and actually has to join the neighborhood and, and you know, become a Middle Eastern country. They already drive like Middle Easterners, so we've just got to get the rest of the thing working. So according to Jeff, there are three things that the Jewish population wants. They want a Jewish state that's overwhelmingly Jewish. They want to have all the lands. 
that's described in the Bible has been given to the Jewish people. They do not want to give it to let any of it be given away to the Palestinians. They want all the land. And they want to be a democracy. Actually, I would disagree with him. The, the trend of the last few years and laws that have been put because of the right-wing government, the Israeli courts have now been told by legislation if there's a conflict between democratic principles and Jewish principles, the Jewish principles prevail. Okay, so Israel is stepping away from a democracy kind of stand. But according to Jeff, they want a Jewish state. They don't want to be a minority in someone else's country. They want to have the land, and they want all of the land of Palestine, and they want to be a democracy. And he said they can have any two. They can't have all three. They can have all the land and they can be a thoroughly Jewish state, but it won't be a democracy because 60% of the population will be disenfranchised. Or they can be living in the land and they can be democratic, but then it won't be a Jewish country. Mind you, Jeff also says that in 50 years, Israel will be, an, will be a completely Arabic-speaking country. That's where the business opportunities are. Israel is well poised to make a matzah out of trade and investment in the Middle East. And Hebrew and Arabic are like, you know, almost the same language. So they're the Jewish aspirate. We want a Jewish homeland. We want the land that God gave our ancestors and we want democracy, although the religious Jews are not really interested in democracy. Palestinian aspirations, they want the land. They're going nowhere. They're not going to leave. They want independence and they want Jerusalem as their capital. And they want an end to the military occupation of the West Bank. They're prepared to accept 1948, but they want at least their line in the sand is 1967, prior to the <laughs> um, occupation starting. So that military occupation, which controls every aspect of life in the West Bank and Gaza, has now been running for 51 years. And they want the right of return for refugees. Well, you can see why American envoys find that when they sit down with the Palestinian demands and the Israeli demands, there's not a lot of common ground. Okay? And so we get a de facto one state solution, which is we'll have one country uh, Israel will collect all the taxes. It'll, it'll give the money to the Palestinian Authority if they're behaving themselves. And if they don't, then it withholds the transfer of funds. So suddenly the police don't get paid, the teachers don't get paid, whatever. Okay. You can't get in or out of Palestine, the West Bank, without going through Israeli international borders and checkpoints. And there are Israeli military checkpoints all through the West Bank because it's under military occupation. So you can see there's a the conflict that's just embedded so deeply in this. So let me, um, there, are, there are still brave souls talking about peace. Um, the, uh, the proposal that I think has the best legs for getting up is, 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 a, is a proposal to divide Israel-Palestine up into about eight or ten districts like Switzerland and depending on the demographic balance of that particular location, then that local government area would be Jewish or Muslim, or Jewish or Palestinian, as the case may be. And its, it's local regulations would reflect that. Um, but there'd be a, a single national parliament, with a single national army, and a single national foreign affairs policy. But of course, that would be elected by universal franchise, which means will be dominated by Palestinians, not by Israelis. And so that at the moment, most Israelis think that the price of the occupation, both economic, military and morally, is, is sustainable. So they're not inclined to look for other paths. Let me, let me just finish my input by talking about something which is I think a challenge to us, but perhaps also a cause of hope. Christians occupy a unique role in Israel-Palestine. In Israel themselves, um, the Christian community is growing, which is a source of puzzlement to people. Um, 
It's growing for two reasons in Israel, um, not the West Bank. Christians are growing in the West Bank because a lot of the Russian Jews who came turned out not to be Jews, but to be Russian Orthodox. So there are something like 40,000 Russian Orthodox Christians that have arrived in Israel in the last 20 or 30 years. And that has, um, but these are Russian Orthodox who speak Hebrew and are very attached to Israel. Whereas the Greek Orthodox, the local church, which is Greek Orthodox, speaks Arabic and it's a church living under occupation. But the Russian Orthodox and the Greek Orthodox are sort of also the same family within the Orthodox movement. So one, but there's another 150,000 or so, 160,000 Christians who have um, arrived in Israel and they're mostly, well they come from two sources. The most significant source are foreign workers from the Philippines who although they're not allowed to bring their spouses with them and they're not allowed to marry Israelis, uh, somehow or other are having children, well, we know how that happens, and the children grow up speaking Hebrew, thinking they're Israelis, but actually their mother does not have Israeli citizenship and will be deported if the Israelis realise what's going on. So there's a very large community of migrant workers, mostly from the Philippines, who are overwhelmingly Christian and Roman Catholic. And they live on the edges of society, particularly in South Tel Aviv. Uh, they live, um, they're more or less, they, the parents are documented, the mother is documented, but they're more or less undocumented foreigners living inside Israel. Like Tel Aviv does not have a church building, full stop. Tel Aviv is a Jewish town. But there are churches meeting in school rooms and in public halls where you can't get a seat because there are so many people coming to church on Sunday. Okay, it's not our problem just at the moment at the cathedral, but yeah, we're working on it. Um, so there's, and these people uh, are devout Roman Catholics and they speak Hebrew and they're thoroughly committed to Israel. This is their economic salvation. And then you've got asylum seekers, refugees coming up from Sudan who are black and Christian, and they're filtering into the society as well. So you've got about 200,000 Christians, Russians, Filipinos, and Sudanese, basically. I put it in broad, thick categories. Russians, Filipinos, Sudanese. Um, and so there's about 200,000 Hebrew-speaking Christians, uh, largely concentrated in the, in the sort of secular Jewish neighbourhoods. They would never survive in a more religious Jewish neighbourhood, but they're, they're doing okay in the secular kind of, in Tel Aviv and up the coast and in Haifa and places like that. Um, so you've got about 200,000 Palestinian Arabic speaking Christians that have been there forever, and now you've got another 200,000 recently arrived Hebrew speaking Christians. So that's, so that's it. There's only about 400,000 Christians. So when we said there was, what, eight and a half plus five and a half, say, what's that, um, 13 million or something? Okay. So out of 13 million people, there's about 400,000 Christians. Less than 1%. Statistically insignificant. Uh, and at the moment, these two groups of Christians have almost no contact with each other. If you're a Palestinian Christian meeting in your village, going to your liturgy in Arabic and complaining about the occupation, you don't have a lot in common with the Russian Orthodox person who's doing really well since he moved his family from Russia to Israel and loves Israel and speaks Hebrew and just wishes those pesky Arabs would all go somewhere else. Okay? So the challenge is, in, in, in a sense, within the Christian community in Israel-Palestine, we have the conflict in, in, in its own sort of microcosm. We've got 200,000 Palestinian Arabic-speaking Christians living under occupation for whom Israel is their worst nightmare. And we have 200,000 uh, Russian Orthodox and Catholic Christians living in Israel for whom Israel is the best thing that ever happened in their life. Now, can we get those 400,000 Christians to actually talk to each other 
and start to work on reconciliation with the wider community. Because if, if, if all the churches do is to replicate the division of the wider society, where's the gospel? Where's the gospel? Okay. So um, that's, the, that's the nub. I'm sure the Palestinian Arabic Christians are going to develop as they have their Palestinian liberation theology. They're going to draw on their scriptures to resist the occupation. No, you don't get that. But um, how do, if what does it does being a Christian make any difference, or does it just is it just sort of window dressing on top? That, that's that's the challenge for these two communities of people. So at the recent uh, World Youth Day, uh, twelve months ago, I guess eighteen months ago. World Youth Day, there were two delegations. There was a delegation of Catholic young people from Israel, and there was a delegation of Catholic young people from Palestine, and they sort of looked at each other and said, what are you doing here? Like, we didn't know you existed. Okay? Maybe if the churches can start bringing our own people together so we can say with Paul, it doesn't matter whether you're Jewish or Greek or whether you're Jewish or Palestinian, that's not the issue. It's, yeah, are you in Christ? And can we, can we make this place, can they make their place um, a more just and, and can they be agents of reconciliation? F uh, final comment. You will find villages, um, you know, generally speaking, the Christian Palestinians tend to be kind of people that move reasonably easily between the, the uh, Muslim world and the Jewish world. Uh, and they're, 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 they're accustomed to that ambiguous space they find themselves in. That may just be the gift that Israel and Palestine are going to need in a few years' time. They're going to need people that are comfortable living with the ambiguity and, um, and not simply falling into rigid, um, uh, exclusive kind of subsets. And this is just a final picture what I hope the future will not look like. Um, this is the wall, the separation wall or the apartheid wall. And the houses over here that had the red tiled roofs, that's a Jewish neighbourhood. And the people on this side of the wall, uh, that's in fact a, a, a Palestinian neighbourhood. Um, I think it's actually the, the edge of the village of Bethany on the Mount of Olives. Uh, and you can see the wall is not straight. And the reason for that is that any time there's vacant land, the wall goes over to the Palestinian edge of the vacant land and then continues so that the vacant land is always on the Israeli side of the fence. So that's not a vision for the future, but it is a vision of the present. Okay, there are probably other questions. I'm more than happy to try and respond to them. I wanted to give you some framework kind of things first.